You may be seated. Hey, I have some exciting things for all the ladies in the house. You have been waiting and we finally get to go. We are going glamping. Yes, I know. Yeah, if you don't know what it is, find a friend and ask them. Super fun, limited spots available. So I don't mind if you want to jump on over to CRC Belton, the events tab and register right now. I'm okay with that. Um, and uh, yeah, so we... It's fun. I mean, basically, someone makes all the meals for you for two days and no children to clean up after, plus Jesus. What more could a mom and a woman ask for, right? So take advantage of that opportunity. It's going to be a lot of fun. We also have ladies' small group discipleship classes uh, opening up right now. So if you want to check out our ladies' group tab under the Connect section of our website and become a part of those, it's a great way to get connected. So wanted to share that important information with you today. Um, my mom was in the first service, but since she is the woman who gave me life, it is uh, my duty to say once again, happy birthday to my mom. We honor her and we love her. Yeah, she's, she's that type of woman who thinks uh, like she always sees the greatness in people and she thinks that all three of her children are completely perfect, have never done anything wrong. So it's totally true about me, but the other two, not so much. Yeah, we're going to be asking a lot of questions today. And to start us off, though, we have to start with the epic from Michael Scott at the office. The question that was asked of him, would you rather be feared or loved? That's easy. It's both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. Any office fans in the house? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever noticed how Jesus had a lot of open-ended questions? Instead of a direct one, he didn't leave a lot of room for yes, no answers in his conversations with people. A lot of times people would come at him with things like, the law says. And as opposed to actually answering the question directly, he would totally flip the script on them and come back at them with another question. And I love it. I don't know about you, but I'm here for it. Jesus had this kind of personality where you just didn't know what to expect. It's kind of almost like, have you ever tried arguing with these like open-ended, flip the script kind of people? Does anybody know? One of, if you know a lawyer, then you definitely have these kind of friends in your life for sure. Um, but it's, it's intentional. The questions that we see throughout the Bible, and once you start thinking about it and looking for them, you're going to see there are a lot of them, a lot more than just the few we'll look at today. But these open-ended questions, they're intentional. They're meant to keep us asking, to keep us learning, to keep us growing. They're designed that it's beckoning us to look deeper, to be more intentional when we're reading the word. So today we're going to look at several familiar stories of Jesus and the questions that he asked or was asked and therefore, they're questions that we should be asking our own hearts. Is anyone in here, do we have any of those like do-it-yourself kind of parents, right? Where you, you told your kid to load the dishwasher and then you went behind them and you redid it the correct way? Yeah, I know some, some people like that. I don't care. I'm like, whatever, if they're in there, it's fine. <laughs> but, um, so, but at some point, you have to teach your children how to do the things, right? So when you have a toddler, you're helping them and you're teaching them how to brush their teeth. Because if you were trying to brush a teenager's teeth, that's just weird, right? Like that's a whole nother level of problem. It's, it's a good parenting practice, but it's also just life wisdom. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing and what I want for you. He's teaching us to search out our heart to get to the answers on our own. It's like the saying, you give a man a fish and he eats for a day, you teach a man to fish and he eats for a lifetime. He's not satisfied with surface level. We wanna ask the heart the hard questions today. So our one truth is this, be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. I want us to be curious when we're reading the scriptures. I want you to go into it and literally place yourself there. I want you to put on the muted tunic, the Jesus sandals, fill the dirt under your feet, and smell the donkeys walking by. The entire experience, I want you to challenge your own natural motivation 
And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the hard questions that Jesus asked and ask them of ourselves. So we have five points today. They're the five W's. Who, what, when, where, and why. I just made all the English teachers in the, prou- in the house very proud. You're welcome. You will use it again at some point. Um, so the first question is who. I've, there are so many songs with like uh, word with, with questions in the title. And I've been singing, who do you love, do you love? Do you know that song by the Chainsmokers? I'm not a singer. But it's such a great song. You know, now I wanted you to have it in your head all week because I've had it in my head all week. So now we're in the same place. But the who questions are questions that we often ask of our own selves. We may say something like, who will I marry? Who will care for me when I'm older? Who will be there for me in my difficult times? But the question that Jesus asks is, who do you say I am? And in the scripture in Matthew verse 16, chapter 16, verse 13, we pick up here. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So lots of people. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, and he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's the question. Who do you say I am? Our first, like, quick answer to that, if you think about that, might be sort of like Peter, son of the living God. And absolutely, that is that is the answer. But for some of us, if we think about who our lives really say he is, it might be more like a butler. We only call on him when we need him. Or like a 911 operator. We just look for him in crisis situations to show up. But we're going deeper today, remember? We're going to put on our muted tunic now. And you ever notice how many times in the word that this question is answered with a different name of who Jesus is? There are so many different pieces to who he is because he is exactly who you need him to be when you need him to be that. So he is our wonderful counselor. He is your rock. He is your redeemer. He is your prince of peace. He is your comforter. He is your great shepherd. He is your master. He is your friend. He is your provider. Amen. It's exactly who you need him to be when you need him to be that. That's who he is. The thing about this question is, if I know who he is, It helps me understand more confidently who I am. Your own identity is tied directly to the question, who do you say I am? And how you see him affects how you see yourself. So when you ask him, when you ask him this time, who do you say I am, the answers to that are going to be different than what you would say about yourself. Because if somebody says, who do you say I am, you start lifting out your natural roles of what you do and who you are. But he says, you are a son or daughter of the most high God. You are a warrior. You are more than a conqueror. You are capable. You are loved. You are enough. That is who he says you are. We have to begin to understand who he is so that we can truly understand who we are. The second question is the what. There are a lot of songs with questions, with questions, and I remember Pastor Matt brought up last week the Tina Turner song, What's Love Got to Do With It? So that one's been in my head all week too. But the question that Jesus asked is, what do you want? And in John 138, turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Now the them here is actually John the Baptist, Andrew, and John. So these are his people, like they're close. These are his friends. And it's an internal question. It's a question of the soul. It's penetrating. It's not a surface level question. He's calling them to more. They don't even realize it, but he's asking them, what do you want from this life? What if Jesus asks you, what do you want? What is your answer to that? I think our Maybe your natural quick response that comes to mind is something 
materialistic or health of a loved one or security, some of the things that we would naturally want to want to have. But then if we go a little deeper, we might realize that what I really want is a genuine relationship with him. I want to be known by him. I want to be seen by the Lord. You want to walk in the fullness of our assigned worth to the king. So today, church, he is asking you, what do you want? He wants to have that conversation with you. But the what's are also the thing that can hold us back sometime, aren't they? The what's are the very things that keep us from moving. What if they don't like me, so you just don't go? Or what if I get hurt, so you never love? What if I fail, so you simply never try? Don't let the what questions in your life hold you back. Jesus is saying to you, what do you want? Be brave, be bold, go, move in him, church. And the third one is when. Have you ever been like asleep, like, you know, the good sleep, like out cold, like your mouth open, drooling, head kicked back, like just dead out, right? And someone comes in and flips the light on. Or if you're at my house, they flip the light on and they have a megaphone and they say, this is God. Yeah, that, that, is, that doesn't happen at your house, just the lights? Okay. Anyway, glad we got that cleared. Um, you can ask him about that. That's a true story. But anyway, <laughs> so when you're out really, really cold and someone flips the light on, you know when the light came on, right? There are moments in these story, this next story where the light turns on for them. There are moments in our life where Jesus shows us something, he drops something, we see something, and we have to guard those. We have to hold on to those and recognize when the light comes on in our lives. In Matthew chapter 14, you know the story because this is where Peter walks on water. It's a really cool story. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. And so Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. So come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Another question. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. When he saw the wind, he was terrified. He had been looking at Jesus, and he was walking on water. But when he began to look at the wind, he was terrified. When we begin looking at the circumstances in our life, that's when we become terrified. When we look at Jesus, we can walk on water. When I look at the circumstances, when I take my eyes off him, and aren't the winds the very thing that keep us from living in the now? It prevents us from a victorious day right now. We have the uncanny ability to make an imaginary, imaginary scenario that keeps us from our current opportunities. And you know what I mean. When I own my own home, when my spouse stops doing this, when my children are bigger, when I retire. And we use these phrases for when that happens... It will be better, different. I'll do this. I'll do that. We did this. I lived, we lived in an apartment in Round Rock, and I was like, when we get into a house, everything will be, these problems will all be better. It will all be gone. So Pastor Matt sweetly moved me to a house. You know what? All those same problems moved right down the road with us. Church, instead of always looking at the when this happens, Shift your focus to what's in front of you right now. We have to learn to love the season that we are in. Your win may be right now. Do you notice the pattern here, his questions? They're designed to draw you out. They're piercing. They're penetrating. He's asking you to search your heart. And the where. When we um, lived in Round Rock, Pastor Mount was on church at a was on staff at a church in Cedar Park. Um, it was a small church. We try not to speak of that time, but I'm going to speak of it for just a minute. <laughs> and um, he, um, I worked in downtown Austin, and so he was responsible of taking our then four-year-old daughter to preschool. 
uh, on the days that she went to preschool. Okay, except for she was daddy's little girl, and so all she had to do was say, Daddy, I don't want to go to preschool. And she wouldn't go to preschool. <laughs> she would go with him to his office, and since it was a small office of under, uh, only three people, she would stay there with him, and she would sit underneath his desk. And she would sit under his desk, and she would read, and she would write, and she would draw. And she would sit there as opposed to going to school and the first time I found this out, it was like, where is she? What is, what is she doing? Why is she not at preschool? And he said, she's, she's sitting at my desk. She's at my feet. The question that God's asking today is, where are you? Some of you need to sit at your dad's feet. You need to go to that place and sit at your father's feet and hear what he has to say. There's a story in Genesis 3 that you're familiar with. You know this story. It's the story of Adam and Eve. And this is where the where are you question comes from. But in the beginning, it starts like this. The serpent, he's telling Eve, right? He's like, hey, check out this tree. It's awesome. Come have some of its fruit. And Eve's like, oh, yeah, wait, we're not really supposed to eat from that tree, you know. And then she's like, well, it does look kind of good because he put that doubt in her head. And so she goes ahead and eats it. She takes a bite of the apple and she's like, oh, that's delicious. And then because women, we just like to share. When we have something good, we're like, hey, try this. So she gives it to her husband because she's so sweet. She's sharing her apple. If that was a man, it would have never, like, gotten past, right? There, yeah, that transaction would be totally different right there. Um, but she does because we share our food and we want you to try it when it's yummy. We can't help it. Um, and verse 7 is where we're going to pick up. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? Do you think he lost them? Do you think he genuinely did not know their physical location? He's not asking where they are. Because God was Life 360 before you ever downloaded that on your phone, okay? He knows their physical location. What he is asking them is the position of their hearts. He knows that something has changed in their life. And he is asking them about what is different now. Satan never insisted. He didn't force they do anything. He used that, power, that same powerful method he asked them a question, which led to a doubt, which led to the next place. And that's the thing about the enemy church. He comes in the smallest ways. He comes in a whisper and lingers, and he just hangs out in our disappointments. So what are the areas in your life that you're made to wonder if God is really for you? Does he have your best interest in mind? Do you believe deep down in that area of place, that place that you've been praying for so long, that you feel like it just lingers and you've seen no movement, today, that's where he wants to know the position of your heart. But the Lord called to, Holly, where are you? But the Lord called to, insert your name, where are you today? You know, there are those moments in life where you can remember, you can almost feel exactly what the day was like, right? The moment was like. So if I said to you, where were you when Kennedy was shot? If you were alive, you know the answer immediately. Where were you when the Challenger blew up? You can picture yourself in that grade school classroom if you were like my age. Or where were you on September 11th, 2001? I can tell you exactly what it felt like, right? Do you guys know those moments? 14 years ago, I had one of those moments. I had been poked and prodded and drugged like a lab rat. If you've ever gone through fertility treatments, you know what that feels like. Uh, we were bouncing back and forth between various job situations and locations, and it just it wasn't a very fun time. And um, I pulled into the Bank of America parking lot in Round Rock, Texas, and I needed to make a deposit because fertility treatments are not cheap, if you've ever done that. And 
I was emotional and I was worn out and I was tired and the bank was closed. And that was the straw. <laughs> and I sat in my car in the Bank of America parking lot. I can still feel it, show you right where it was today. And I cried like a baby. I cried and I said, God, where are you? Where are you now? I'm trying to do all these things to love you and serve you. I'm fighting for a person that I've never met. I'm, f I'm feeling crazy. I can't make ends meet. I can't do it. And I said, where are you? And you know what he said? He said, I'm right here. You have to surrender these things to me. I had been trying to accomplish all those things on my own strength and in my own power. And God said, I'm right here. You have to surrender those to me. That's what Jesus is asking of your heart today. Where are you? Be honest because he already knows the answer. Some of us simply need to sit at our dad's feet today, church. And the last one is a why. If you have a toddler, it is hands down your favorite question on earth, right? Because they asked it like 40 times a day. It's really fun on someone else's child. <laughs> One why, one why question leads to another. Like, it's amazing how they can do it. But I, don't, I don't even know how they make that happen. But they're like, why are you washing the dishes? Well, because they're dirty. Why are they dirty? Well, because we ate off them. Why did we eat off them? Because people are hungry. Like, you know, there's like, and they just keep going and going. And it's actually pretty impressive, honestly. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, it says this. The, the Lord says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And not do what I tell you. I actually think we should be more toddler-like. I think we should question our own natural propensity. Especially now. Why do we behave the way that we just naturally behave like we always have? And we just accept these deep-rooted traits as if that's who we have to be. We default to anger because we think it's justified. We naturally just assume the worst about another because someone vital in our life broke a trust at a young age. We run to a food or substance for comfort because we think that's going to work for a moment. We can't see one positive thing in our own mirror because we've been told for so long that we're not good enough. Church, we have to stop going to default. We have to begin to ask why. We have to push back on our own thoughts and actions and understand, do I see this because of my past experiences? Is it the truth or is it a lie? He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? What we say versus what we do. There's often a gap in between the two of those, right? I call him Lord, Lord, but do I always act as if he is my Lord, Lord, right? So good, any good relationship is two ways, right? If you're married, you have a friend, a family member, whatever it is, you share all the things. You share the good things, the great things, the exciting things, but you also share the hurts and the pains and the challenges, and that's what God is asking of us. He just wants to have the conversation with you. He's simply beckoning you to have the conversation. So a couple of weeks ago, I was um, sitting at my desk, and um, the birds outside were, like, specifically loud. I don't know. They were, like, really loud. And um, I felt pretty confident they were calling me to come outside. Yeah, you know, so I know that sounds a little crazy. I'm, I'm not crazy. But the birds were calling me outside, so I went. <laughs> but um, as I walked outside, I find this tree. And there's these two trees kind of in the back of our house. And they're, they're full of these little yellow, they're warblers is what they were. And there were like hundreds of them. They have like a little yellow on their belly. And there were, I don't know, easily two to 300 of these birds. And they're naturally an active bird, so they kind of, move about, they'll pop from like branch to branch, but, but they were kind of all sitting together and just one or two would move at a time. And um, I felt like I should keep walking that direction and just kind of see what was happening over there. They were just so loud and happy and I just wanted to be where they were, you know. And um, 
of course, you know, anybody, like you'd much rather be out with the birds than at your desk, right? So I'm like, desk, goodbye, the birds are calling me, see you later, I'm out of here, right? And so I start walking towards the birds. And once I finally get like right below the tree, like all 300 of them at once did this huge swoosh. They all moved. Have you ever seen them do that? Like the entire swarm, they all moved at once. And it made this, there were so many of them that it literally made like a wind. And it was just this huge movement. And it was beautiful. And I was like, wow. And I heard the Lord whisper to me, obedience creates motion. Church, your obedience creates motion. It has to be simple. It can feel like a very simple move for you. But in the kingdom, it creates a huge motion. Obedience is the currency of heaven. And we have to step in that when he calls. Why? Why would we call him Lord, Lord, and not do what he's asked us to do? It's that simple. That's what he is asking of us today, church. Your heart has questions and Jesus is beckoning us to himself. Proverbs 25, two, this is one of my favorite verses. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter is the glory of kings. That's you, church, you're the kings. We search out what he has for us. Every day, every moment, not just on Sunday, listen to your shepherd, you will hear his voice. I just wanna challenge you to take these questions, take them home and ponder them. Ask the Lord, why would I call you Lord, Lord? Who do you say I am? Play these back. Challenge yourself with what he is challenging you with today. Amen, church. Go ahead and stand to your feet if you would today. The praise team is going to sing a song. I want you to worship with them. Some of you have questions of the heart that you need prayed with. You have situations where you're like me. You say, Lord, where are you? I don't know. And he has, we have answers. God has answers for you today. So our prayer team is gonna come forward and they're here to pray with you and agree with you about any of those questions that you may be wrestling with. But stay just a moment and worship with us today as we close.